Matt Stazel is the Pastoral Counseling Director at Grace Family Church. She has her BA Honours degree in Theology and Counseling, obtained in the UK at the Waverley Christian Counseling Centre and London School of Theology. She founded Edify in 2019. Her heart is to see every local church in South Africa invested in some level of counseling training resources so that we can holistically offer hope by meeting the needs of local communities. To top it all off, Mads is a wife and a boy mom. Please stand to your feet as we welcome Mads Dazel. Thank you so much. It really is an honor and a privilege. Please be seated to be able to share with you today. Uh, I was telling one of the ladies that the first time I ever wore a dress, I think my eldest was about four years old and uh, he had never seen me in a dress. And he looked at me and he goes, that's a beautiful floating thing. <laughs> he never had a vocabulary for dress because I'm not really a dressy kind of girl. So that was very funny for me. And um, and I, I live in a house just full of boys. There's testosterone everywhere. Uh, actually, last year, Christmas, my hubby came home with a little puppy, and uh, we got the certificate, and it was a girl, and so we called her Bella, and then we took her for her first injection, and we realized that Bella was actually a fella. And uh, <laughs> so even when we tried to bring a little bit of estrogen into the house, it turned out to be a boy. So it really is great to be here with you all. Uh, as a pastoral counselor, I am so passionate about seeing people uh, come into healing and wholeness, that they live according to their intentional design. It's my heart, it's my passion, it's my story. And um, I've actually brought my book here today. It's called Care for Wholeness. Care is an acronym for creating authentic restorative environments for our healing journeys. And I'm going to share a little bit of my story as we speak today because I want to speak into the place of how do we, how do we live in wholeness? How do, we, how do we align ourselves to the heart of God, of what He originally designed us for? So, But I want to give this book away. If there's someone in the room who's maybe just left school, and you feel like you've got a heart maybe for counseling, but you're also in a journey of trying to deal with your story. I want to bless you with this. Anybody? Okay, that hand went up. Okay, here we go. Can you pass that back for me? Thank you so much. But it is in the resource center. Okay. As women, we know the power of a label. I remember when I was about... 12, 13 years old, you know, when you start becoming very aware of what you're wearing. Um, my uncle had come to town and he said he would take me shopping for my birthday. And I was into surfing and he took me to the surf shop and there was this luminous pink. It's the first time in my life I ever wore pink. I'm more of an orange girl, as you can see. But anyway, there was this luminous pink uh, gotcha. Do you remember gotcha? gotcha tracksuit and he's like you can have anything in the shop and I saw this gotcha track and I was like I just fell in love with it so anyway he bought it for me and I lived in this thing so much that it, it went from luminous pink to baby pink <laughs> you know and um and I remember when I eventually grew out of it I actually cut the gotcha label out so I could sew it into my next tracksuit Anybody ever done something like that? Don't leave me alone here. Come on. <laughs> so we know the power of a label because we live in a world where often we are defined by a label. Our value is defined by these labels. And I actually did a little bit of research to kind of consider what is the most expensive dress ever worn on the red carpet? All right. So this was during, um, this was 2013, the Academy Award. Jennifer Lawrence walked down the red carpet wearing this dress. It should come up on the screens by Christian Dior. Okay. Anybody want to guess how much this dress, never mind the jewelry. Okay. Anyone want to guess how much this dress was worth? Four million dollars. How's that? for understanding the power of a label. Man, I would have been too scared to sneeze if I was wearing that. <laughs> and um, 
How many of you would love to walk in a $4 million dress? Nah, it's way more fun in a gotcha tracksuit. <laughs> so let me ask you this question. How do you see yourself? How do you define yourself? You see, as women, we often want to control what others see. And when we're controlling what others see, it also means we're controlling what we show. And we walk, we walk around often with fan faces. I always use this, this uh, example, and some of you who've heard me speak before, what is the acronym for fan? Feeling, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Anyone feeling fan today? <laughs> we put on our faces because we want to control the narrative about our values. And the problem when we live in that kind of space, what we end up doing is we actually hand the world around us a marker pen and we, we give others the power to determine our value. I'm sure many of you have watched America's Got Talent. Who's the one judge everybody wants to impress? Simon, because he's the most critical judge. And people will even come back purely to try and change his opinion about you. And often, as women, we can live our lives trying to change the opinion of the most critical judge in our life. And the minute you hand over people that marker pen, you give them the power to define you, it will result in living a competitive life and a performance life and a comparison life. And it will result in high anxiety. So what are you showing the world? Are you showing them just your fan face? Or are you showing them the truth about who you are? In the counseling room, I'm also very aware that we end up labeling our value even by our successes and failures in the world. One of the greatest lies the enemy wants you to believe is that who you are, your value is determined by your experiences. If you fail, he will speak the lie over you. It's because you are a failure. If you're rejected, he will speak the lie. It's because you are unlovable. He wants to turn what you go through into who you are. You see, then we end up living our lives trying to defi define our value and our worth by our capacity, our children's success, our spouse's happiness, our personal success, having it all together, whilst often on the inside we're absolutely falling apart. And it will result in calculated authenticity, maintaining a facade. And it leads to what I call fragmented living, where you're only showing an aspect of yourself because the rest you keep hidden in secret. How many of you have that one thing that you're most ashamed about that you don't want anybody to know because you're afraid that if somebody else finds out, you'll be rejected? And so our peace ends up in pieces and we find ourselves in fragmented living. So how do you see yourself? Well, there's a beautiful story in scripture about a woman who didn't see herself very well. The story is found in John 4 verse 9, and I'm going to pick it up from here. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Why are you asking me? It's a, it's a disqualification question. Why are you asking me? How many of you have disqualified yourself because you've defined yourself by your status, by your gender, by your skin color. When I was at school, there was the A class, the B class, the C class. I was in the G class. And G did not stand for good grades. 
And for years, I disqualified myself because I thought I was stupid. I didn't realize I just had dyslexia. I only realized that about seven, eight years ago. But I disqualified myself for many years because of a symbol on a report card. So I became a hairdresser because I couldn't get into varsity. But hairdressers are undercover counselors. You know what I'm saying? And when I finally got into Bible college, it was not because of my grades, it was because of my age. So there's hope for you in the summer. <laughs> but how many of you have disqualified yourself because of something? Maybe it was a grade. Maybe it was the way you look, an experience, a life choice you made. Jesus' reply to her disqualification question he never actually answered her question. This is what he said. This is John 4, verse 10. Jesus replied, If only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. If only you knew who you were. If only you knew who was for you. If only you knew who has a plan for you. If only you knew who's got a gift for you and a purpose for you. If only you knew who will never leave or forsake you. If only you knew how much he loves you that he died for you. If only you knew. How differently would you be living your life if you knew the truth about who you are in Christ. You see, we understand the power of a made by label. And being known begins by understanding who made you. The power of a made by label. Psalm 139, 13 to 14. You made. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me wonderfully complex, and oh, how complex us ladies can be. Next time a spouse or a guy says to me, you're so complex, you go, I'm not just complex, I'm wonderfully complex. Let's claim our complexity. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well you know it. You made, do you know you're made by our label? The King James Version says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The word fearfully is the word yare. Tell the person next to you, I am yare. It means to stand in awe, to be in awe to the point of reverence, to have honor and respect. You are Yare. The word wonderful is Paule. Tell the person, I am Paule. And this is what Paule means. It means to be distinctly marked out, to be distinguished to be set apart, to show a difference, to show how marvelously and wonderfully you've been made. How good is that? We are Paule and Yare, and what's it? Yare and Paule. Claim your complexity and how marvelous you are. You have been distinctly marked out and set apart, and we should stand in awe and in reverence because of understanding our unique value. But you see, your value is rooted in knowing who you are and who made you. So I want to give you three steps today to aid us on the journey of healing and wholeness. How do we align these spaces with truth? How do, we, how do we take our broken pieces and lean into the fruit and the wisdom and the gifting that God has given us so that we can start to walk in the fullness of the way God created us? The first step is owning your limp. Stop blaming. I could have spent many years of my life blaming 
the world I grew up in, and it was very dysfunctional. But the reality is we all fall short. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. There's no perfect mom. There's no perfect kids. There's no perfect spouse. There's no perfect friend. We all fall short. Every one of us was born a sinner. Psalm 51.5, For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. So how do we take ownership of that? Well, it's easy to take ownership of it when you don't define yourself by it. It's easy to take ownership of it when you're not defining. You see, for years, I never took ownership of the fact that I can't spell. Now I tell people I'm a confidently bad speller. <laughs> but I'm not defined by my ability to spell. You see, if the enemy wants me to believe that you're defined by your ability, then I would have never written a book. Or editors. <laughs> to help me in those spaces. So stop blaming and start owning those spaces that need healing. Let go of those that have hurt you. And I'm not saying, I don't wanna trivialize this because I know what it's like to feel wounded and to feel hurt and to feel rejected and abandoned. But we gotta work through those spaces to come to a place of healing. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a, ta a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. Have you ever tried to have a rational conversation with a child? If my boys say, can I have ice cream for breakfast? And I say, no, their childish thinking's like, you don't love us. You can't come to our party anymore. And I'm like, I'm paying for that party. But many of us are still living under childish thinking. We're still believing childish thoughts. We, we turn again those experiences into our identity. And so we've got to learn to let go of how we have chosen to protect ourselves. You see, the story of the woman of the well, she chose to protect herself by living a life of isolation. She went to go draw water in the middle of the day to avoid others who went in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening. And, to, and Corinthians um, 10 verse 4 says that we need to demolish the strongholds. And a stronghold is any behavior that I turn to as a means of holding safety. And she was living a stronghold of isolation. Maybe your stronghold is one of, I will never let anyone in. I will keep people at arm's length. I will only ever show them the good side of me not the bad side. I will never be vulnerable. I will never trust a man. I will never trust a woman. I will live in self-protective strategies, as psychology calls it, to keep me from feeling further hurt. But the problem with those strategies is they also keep you from feeling the good and living in freedom. So we need to manage these spaces. And we also need to invest in what we need to heal. You see, when you own your limp, you can't just own it. You have to also invest in what you need to find healing. I never had a good relationship with my mom growing up. It was very dysfunctional. And I remember it was only in my 30s, my early 30s. I was still single and I was, uh, I was renting a room on the property of my pastor. They, were, they ran a church and they had like a bunch of rooms that you could rent out. and. Um, I remember there was a day where I was needing a mom chat. My mom had already passed away by then. And, um, and the pastor's wife, she was one of these women that just oozed momness. You know those people? They're just like, they're just natural moms. And I could see her from across the courtyard. She was washing dishes. And um, it took me two hours to build up the courage to walk 10 meters. Because... In my mind, the belief was, if my own mom didn't care, why would another woman care? And so the fear crippled. And part of your journey of healing is actually walking in the opposite of what your fear says. 
And I remember I, I walked across the courtyard and I knocked on the door. And I, when I finally got there, I burst into tears. And I think I'd gone through a breakup or something. I don't know what it was. And I was like, I just need a mom chat. And she made some tea and we chatted and she prayed. And, and, um, and then she taught me the most powerful lesson I've ever learned. And this is the point I want to make when it comes to healing our journeys. She said to me, Mads, there are going to be days where you may knock on my door. And though my heart wants to be there for you, sometimes my capacity can't. And I want to make sure that you don't define my no into your value. And that's when I realized I need to find five moms. Because if one's empty, I've got four more. <laughs> you see, God places the lonely in family. And my body was not designed to be held up by my big toe. Because my big toe will collapse under that weight. You see, we're designed to be part of the body of Christ. Titus 2, 3 to 5 says, speaks about older women investing in the younger women, about life and relationships. Proverbs eleven fourteen. 14, without good direction, people lose their way. The more wise counsel you follow, the better your chances. God is so wise. He places us in community. We are part of the body of Christ. We're not meant to exist as individual body parts. But you know what? In the same way that my ankle can twist if my ankle twists, I don't phone up a friend and I go, you won't believe what my ankle did today. <laughs> like, honestly, it's part of the body of Christ and it totally let me down. It actually rejected me to the point where I fell down and it did nothing to pick me up. Can you believe my ankle? You know what? I'm not going to speak to it ever again. <laughs> we don't do that. What does the rest of my body do when my ankle twists? It comes together to support it so that it can heal. Hurt people hurt people, but healed people heal people. God wants us to be a part of the body of Christ. Never allow the actions of one to define your value. People will fail you, but it's not because of their hearts. It's generally because of their capacity. So we need to own our limp. The second thing that we need to do is we need to align ourselves to design. That takes an intentional placement. You see, God is in the restoration business. He's given us every tool we need to heal. But we have to just align ourselves to that space. Psalm 18 20 to 24, God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. I'm going to say that again. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. When I got my act together, he gave me a fresh start. And now I am alert to his ways. I don't take God for granted. Every day I review the way he works. I try not miss a trick. I feel put back together and I'm watching my step because God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. You see, part of our healing journey starts with aligning ourselves to his original design for me. Psalm 139 verse 16, he says, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. I'm going to say that again. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. My youngest boy loves to play Lego. Anyone else have Legos all around your house? You don't like stepping on them in the middle of the night. And he loves those ones where you get the booklet and it starts off, you know, take three of this piece and four of that piece and you, and you build and like, you know, three, four hours later, you've got this masterpiece. Now imagine if as you're walking to put your masterpiece 
on a display mantle, you trip and you fall, and it smashes into a thousand pieces. What do you do if you've already thrown that book away? It can feel almost impossible to rebuild. And for many of us, often that's what life feels like. We have been so smashed up by life that we feel so fragmented into many, many pieces, and we don't know where to start. As we sit in these places of brokenness, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Isn't it amazing that you were dreamed of by a dreamer? You were planned by a planner. You were created by a creator. You were built by a builder. You were fashioned by a designer. You were sculpted by a sculptor. You were knit by a knitter. I mean, forget Gucci and Prada. You were made by the father. You like that? I think we need to make t-shirts like that. <laughs> Do you know you're made by value? Part of your journey is aligning yourself to his truth and inviting him into those spaces. So we've looked at owning our limbs. We've looked at aligning ourselves to design and I want to speak about how do we bring our broken pieces to him. I remember when I was in my early teens, my parents divorced before I turned one. I never saw my dad much growing up. His name was Dad. I never knew him as father. And um, I remember watching friends run home, jump into their dad's uh, laps, and uh, just get loved and cuddled by him. And I never knew what it felt like to sit in a dad's lap and feel his loving arms around me. It wasn't the experience I ever had in my life. And um, I was in the UK, and um, a friend was preaching on a text in Scripture. And, you know, that desire to know what it feels like to sit in a dad's lap is not someone... It's not, it's not something you generally go around telling people. You know what I'm saying? And she preached on this text in Deuteronomy 33 verse 12 that says, Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him. For the one the Lord loves rests with his head between his shoulders. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like the very desire of my heart is in Scripture. And I remember just meditating on this verse for months and months, just chewing on it, trying to just, you know, you know get it into every DNA of my soul. I'm a very visual person. And, and actually, it was about a year or so later, I was invited to share my testimony on this verse at a women's conference in the UK. And uh, at the end of the event, uh, a lady came up to me and she said, I am a prophetic artist. And uh, before this conference, God gave me a picture to draw because he said to me that my daughter needs a picture of her with her dad. And this is the picture I got. There I am with my dad. God notes the deepest desire of your heart even if you've never spoken it out loud. And he meets you exactly where you are. But it means bringing the pieces of our brokenness before him. And that can be scary sometimes. When I was studying to become a counselor, we would have these practical weekends away where we would have to, you know, learn some skills and then we would have a practical experience because they believe that if you haven't been counseled yourself, you can't counsel someone else. So we would go through these kind of creative journeys. And um, we were learning about psychodrama. I'm not going to get into the complexities of that. But um, I remember just being at a space in my life where I was ready for God to work. 
You know when you just, you come expectant. Anyone come expectant today? We come expectant. And I came expectant and I had this idea of how God was going to bring a healing to something that he was working on in my life at the time. And I remember there was this lady who was guarding the weekend and she said, right, who wants to go first? And I stuck up my hand. I was like, I'm pumped. And there were only about 15, 16 of us. And, and she chose somebody else. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm gracious. That's, someone else can go first. That's fine. Anyway, that person wins. And then next session, she's like, who wants to go next? And she chose somebody else. Now I'm getting a little bit, you know, Okay, Grace, Grace, breathe. Let them go first. Third session, who wants to go next? And I wasn't that amped anymore. She chose somebody else. By that evening, she had chosen two other people and ignored me. I was fuming. And the narrative starts in your mind. You see, God doesn't really care about you. You see, he's forgotten you just like your own family forgot you. And all the old emotions, the trauma, the, the rejection, the abandonment started to rise. And I remember I went to dinner that night and I was sitting at the table just pushing food around. You know, when you just play with your food. And one of the lecturers had kind of sussed out what was going on. And she came and sat next to me at the table and she started talking to me about... A kitten that was abandoned, that she rescued. I don't really recall. And how it like ran under the bed of the house. And, and like, you know when you're just like, please just go away. <laughs> so by this stage, most had left the, the room. And I just plonked my head down on my arms on the table to try and rudely, I will admit, rudely give her the message of like, I'm not interested. My defenses were up. The stronghold was there. I was like, I will never trust again because you know what? God just lets you down. Because often we have an expectation of how God's going to heal. And we put him in a box because we want to be in control. And whilst I was sitting there with my head on my, on my arms, she was still going on about this rescue kitten. God said to me very clearly, look at your thumbs. And I, I was holding both my thumbs like that in my hand. And God said to me, I want you to stick out your thumb and ask her to hold it. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. I mean, I'm in my late 20s. So I'm like, so... I'm having this full-on argument. So you want me to stick out my thumbs and ask my lecturer, who was German, to hold on to them? Yep. Well, we, we argued for a while, and then eventually I realized God was up to something. So I was like, still angry, still head on my, she's still going on about kittens. Who knows? I eventually just kind of mumbled, God has told me, and I had both my thumbs out, that you need to hold on to my thumbs. And she quietly and gently did. And I cracked. I sobbed myself to sleep for two hours. I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I eventually woke up in the dark and she was still holding my thumbs. I mean, now I'm just embarrassed. Because <laughs> I'm like, snot, red face, thumbs out. She's sitting there quietly just holding onto my thumbs. She's probably thinking, how long do I have to hold onto them for? You know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of sheepishly like lifted my head and she's like, you okay? And I'm like, I think so. so she's like, I know God's doing something. He didn't just say anything. And I'm like, okay, cool. But there was something that happened in that moment where instead of me comforting myself, I had to take a broken part of me and lean into allowing somebody else to bring healing and hold on to me. And the power of learning vulnerability takes incredible courage. And the next day, the lady who was running this weekend, she said to me, um, hey, Mads, God told me not to choose you because he wanted to do something. And actually, like, everything inside of me wanted to choose you, but God told me not to. 
And I was like, that's cool. God met me last night. It was amazing. I never shared with anybody what was actually going on in that space. Fast forward about three, four months later. We're on another one of these practical weekends as students. And uh, we were each given a lump of clay. And we were told to prayerfully consider what we needed to make of this lump of clay for the person sitting on our left. Please don't ask me what I made for the person on my left. It's probably like a snowman. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not very creative. But anyway, I was sitting next to the person that was on my right. I was on, on his left. was the only man in the group. And he was this guy called Angelo. He was Italian. He was the only father in the group of students. And God told him to take the lump of clay and to squeeze it so it made it a mold of the inside of his hand. And I didn't know this. And he gave this to me. And it looked like a, like a weird-looking shell. And I said... So what is this? He goes, I don't know, but God told me that you needed something new to hold on to. And again, I sobbed. God knows the desire of your heart. He knows what you need to heal. And he is a provider. And so as we come into land, I want to go back to that scripture in Psalm 18, 20 to 24, God made my life complete when I placed all of the pieces before him. Right now, I want you to close your eyes. If there is a piece in you that feels broken, that you are wanting God to bring healing to, don't you want it to stand? Thank you. Our healing journey starts with us bringing our pieces before him. And I want to encourage you, don't put God in a box on how he's going to do it. I've shared aspects of my story with you that happened over years. But sometimes healing happens in a moment. And we don't know when that moment's going to be. But God just wants us to be vulnerable and brave and courageous. That we would bring our pieces before him. Because he will write the text of your life when you open the book of your heart to him. And so, Father, I just lift up every single one of your daughters right now. And I pray that today will be a divine intervention. I thank you, Jesus, that you know each one by name. That there are, there are some who are feeling utterly abandoned and forgotten. And the scripture that just came to mind is where it says, even if a mother forgets her child, I will not forget you. I believe God wants to speak that over some today, that you are not forgotten. That even if a mother forgets her young, which feels almost physically and mentally impossible, the Father will not forget you. That he sees you, he loves you. You are the apple of his eye. And your place is right here between his shoulders and his heart. And all you gotta do is bring your pieces before him. So Jesus, we just pray right now for that intervention. Just fill each one of your daughters with a fresh revelation of your love for them. The Father's love, the comforting love, the protecting love, the provision of a dad, the strength of a dad, the affirmation of a dad. The, daughter want, the Father wants to delight in you. He wants to have his first dance with you. He cherishes you. Father, won't you just comfort those who are grieving? Thank you that you're a good, good father. Just continue to receive. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. And all God's daughters said, Amen.